Okay, so Corin Watts is also from Manaki Whenua Landcare Research, and Corin is going to be talking to us about invertebrate monitoring using conventional methods and also using environmental DNA. Thanks, Corin. Do I need to just click that on? Oh, no, you're, you're good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, good morning. Um, as Al's already said, I'm Corin, I'm an invertebrate ecologist from Manaki Whenua Landcare Research in Hamilton. And this morning I'm going to talk about a new tool that we've developed for invertebrate monitoring. So one of the goals of Cape to City is to restore indigenous biodiversity across 26,000 hectares of the productive landscape in the Hawke's Bay. And this is going to occur through mammal control and habitat restoration. When you're restoring and managing native biodiversity, it's really important to consider invertebrates. So we have 20,000 species of described um, invertebrates. We probably think that the actual number is up around 70,000, but who knows, in New Zealand. And so this makes up 60% of New Zealand's biodiversity. And they, invertebrates also provide critical roles in ecosystem functioning, such as pollination and litter decomposition. Unfortunately, though, when you trap them, uh, you, it normally results in, in many specimens. So you can see in this photograph here, it's taken out of a malaise trap and it's basically an insect soup. So it, yeah, it's very expensive to process these samples. It's time consuming and you're really restricted by experts. Um, there's very few taxonomists in New Zealand. So for example, in, in Europe, if you found a carabid beetle, you could go to a key and key it out to species. That just hardly exists in New Zealand. Um, though they are working on the fauna keys, which are great. But it just doesn't, we just don't have the expertise that, that overseas does. So that really limits us in what we can do with um, invertebrates at the moment in New Zealand. So eDNA has come along and it certainly has the potential to transform how we monitor invertebrates in these restoration programs. So when I talk about eDNA, um, I'm talking about environmental DNA, so that's DNA that's in the environment. So for example, you could take a soil sample, um, target the target DNA would be, say for example, birds, and you could find out all the bird fauna that lives in that, that area um, just by looking at the soil, and that includes extinct species like moa, for example. Another example would be um, if you took a, a, a water sample from a stream, anything upstream from that sample that you took, you could actually detect, say, all the fish species that lived in that area. Another example that we've been working on recently um, is if you took a leaf, um, mushed up the leaf, extracted the DNA, you could actually find out all the invertebrates that have walked across that leaf by looking at the, the um, DNA that those insects and invertebrates have left in their footprints. Um, so that's pretty cool. So when I talk about eDNA, that's what I'm referring to as environmental DNA. So within the Cape City project, um, um, we explored the potential for using eDNA to be used as an invertebrate monitoring tool. So we had an identical approach, uh, identical budget for each approach, so that was the conventional monitoring um, and versus the eDNA monitoring. And so our field site here that we used in the Hawke's Bay area was Mohi Bush Scenic Reserve, and you can see it in the photograph there, it's a perfect rectangle size. And so um, we thought it was really well set up for um, looking at edge versus interior of, of one of these small um, patches of, of indigenous biodiversity um, in a highly modified landscape. So we had um, 12 20 by 20 metre plots um, in, in the scenic reserve, six on the edge and six in the interior. So we used um, two, to, to monitor the invertebrate communities conventionally, we used two common techniques. The first was malaise trap, and you can see it here on the left-hand photograph. So these are basically small tents that um, sample flying insects or foliage-dwelling invertebrates. So they basically fly into the tent and then fly north up into the collecting jar. Um, and then we also, so we had one of these traps at each, at each plot centred in the middle. Then we had four pitfall traps surrounding um, the malaise traps. So these are basically cups sunk into the ground and they sample ground-dwelling invertebrates. 
we had these um, traps out for a month um, over the best time to collect invertebrates, which is basically December to January, so over the Christmas time. Um, and we then collected the samples and we sorted the invertebrates that we collected in those samples to order and then um, identified beetles to species. So for the eDNA collection, um, we use samples from what we call the bulk invertebrate samples, so the malaise and pitfall traps. And this is actually the first study that's looked at what's the DNA that comes out of a sample when you know what's gone into it. So I counted all the invertebrates, so we knew exactly what had gone into the blender and so what was going to come out the other end. We also then took a soil sample, um, soil samples from each plot, because we thought this was a, um, a much potentially a much more efficient way of monitoring um, the eDNA from vertebrates at a plot, because it meant that it was only one one field visit, whereas for example the the um, trapping you had to go set the traps up and then come back a month later. So we, that's why we tested soil to see if it was a lot more efficient way of, of collecting data. So basically for the eDNA collection and, and how we process it, so we collect the sample, we extract the DNA, we amplify that target DNA, for, so for, in this example it's invertebrates. We then sequence that target DNA and then we match it to the DNA um, that we have in a, in a national reference collection library. So some results, so um, the first set of results up there is from the conventional monitoring. So we caught um, 7,503 specimens from 22 orders, so you can imagine how much time in the lab that is um, counting things. Um, we got 922 beetles from 34 families and 121 species. Um, and basically this, um, showed that it was a typical, what you'd expect is a typical invertebrate community of a small isolated tower forest um, in a highly modified landscape, um, with the majority of, of um, invertebrates being very small in size, so less than 10 mils. But what was really encouraging um, from these results was that we found very few introduced species, and the ones that we did find were basically all on the edge um, of, of Mohi bush, so that was really interesting. Um, the results from the eDNA bulk invertebrate samples found that we had 27 orders from 17 beetle species, families, and these were 90% in common with what we'd found with the conventional monitoring, so that was pretty close to the, the, with those two techniques. When you looked at the results of the eDNA from the soil samples, we got 48 orders, so quite a few more orders. Um, 18 beetle spe um, families and only 65% in common um, with the conventional monitoring. So now I'm going to show some um, ordinations and I know they're very scary um, but I'll talk you through them but they're a really good way of showing um, community composition. So basically the closer the dots are to each other, um, so each dot represents a plot um, and don't really worry about what the labels are. Um, each time where you have dots that are closer together, it shows that the, the community composition at a plot is very, very similar. So the interior um, is the blue and the edge plots are the red. So on the left hand side is the invertebrates collected from the conventional techniques, then you've got the bulk eDNA, and then the soil DNA. So basically um, all three techniques show that there was a clear separation in edge and interior plots. Um, and this also um, was the same for beet when you analysed it for beetles. Um, and the eDNA detected a diverse array of invertebrate taxa, in fact many more than for the um, conventional technique for the same cost. And they all showed that, um, well, eDNA showed that um, you got good results at a community level, but there was very different results for sampling technique, um, and this was a very strong effect. Um, the soil showed quite different communities, but I guess it had the advantage of having, being a, a one-off visit to the field. But a disadvantage of, of the soil DNA was that the um, DNA we collected was um, of very low quality, and there was lots of junk DNA. So this technique certainly shows promise, um, 
but, there's always a but. Um, so these graphs here show um, on the vertical axis is um, invertebrate order, along the horizontal axis is the number of taxa. The first graph on the left hand side is family, then moving across to genera and then species. So the orange um, is um, DNA sequences um, that we collected that don't have any reference references in the database. The green is where we do. So you can see at family, we have a little bit. At genera, a little bit less. And at species, there's hardly anything. And in fact, less than 5% of the DNA we found actually had reference barcodes. So we need to do more barcoding for this technique to move forward. This is easy to do. It just needs to be done. And within Manaki Fena, we were actually doing that in some aligned projects. So what are some management implications of this study? Well, um, eDNA certainly offers a new tool in the toolbox for monitoring invertebrates, and it's certainly dependent on your objectives. And I think it's a really, really good tool at a community level, um, broad scale level, if you wanted to look at order changes. Um, at the species level at the moment, for example, where we looked at beetles, we just don't have enough barcodes um, for it to be meaningful. And the eDNA certainly showed a diverse range of invertebrates, and it certainly complemented our um, conventional monitoring. So we just need to do a lot more IDing and a lot more barcoding. So what are some possible future research um, that we could do with eDNA? Well, I think that we could certainly use it for um, monitoring changes in invertebrate community following predator control. We, ne we really need clear objectives for this project and um, good pre and post treatment sampling. Um, and again, a lot more effort needs to be put into barcoding. Some other potential uses for eDNA in the Cape to City project could be that we could monitor disease pressure, for example, E. coli, and how it relates to land cover, water flows, and human disease. And that's a really good example with what's happened um, last year in um, Havelock North. And I'm going to finish um, with some rec recommendations for invertebrates within the Cape to City project, because this is where I feel my most comfortable, not talking about DNA. Um, is that I think it would be really important to monitor large body taxa, for example, um, tree wetter. The Hawke's Bay tree wetter is restricted to Hawke's Bay. Um, and so tree wetter are known to be responsive to mammal control. And so this is an iconic insect that could actually be really useful in engaging with the public around this project. A couple of other examples there, I've put up in moths, just to show that I'm not completely biased to wetter. Um, and I think it's really important to survey for rare and threatened species within the Cape to City footprint. Are these species habitat limited or are they predator limited? So for example, um, one of the moths I've got up there is the northern Pimelia cutworm, and that's a high priority one threatened species. It completely relies on Pimelia um, for its larval form. And so this has really declined in coastal areas. So it might be that this moth isn't actually dependent on predator control, but more around habitat restoration. The other example I've got there, up there is Acidodes. That was once known from Taupo, Hawke's Bay kind of area, all the way south to Invercargill. Um, it's known to feed on ranunculus, so the native buttercup. And it's completely gone from its former range now, except on the west coast of the South Island. So this would be a really cool example of a, of a moth that we could bring back to Hawke's Bay. And these, I think these species are potentially examples of the way forward that we could engage with the public around invertebrates. Thank you. Methods, sorry, thanks. Um, you talked about the beetles that you found in the traditional methods, mm -hmm. which were 34 families, and then yep. in the in the eDNA, the 17 families. So it's half of what you're finding. Is that is that a good result? Is well, I think it's just that the barcodes there are not there for certain families. 
So that's where we need to spend a lot of our um, time is in that bar barcoding. Um, right. We just don't have, you know, because New Zealand has a lot of families that aren't known anywhere else, so a lot of our, um, sometimes we can get pick up um, barcodes, references from international databases. We can't do that with, with that, um, some of those families. And I should have said too that um, in the eDNA, we're picking up DNA that's not just in those, the, the insects that are in the samples. It's, for example, if a predator invertebrate has eaten a prey and you pick, potentially pick up that DNA as well because it's DNA that's in the stomach. So it may have not been in the conventional monitoring. So you, you, the DNA is there, we just can't tell what it is because we don't exactly. have the barcode. Yep. Right. Okay. Yep. We don't have a barcode to match it to. Right.